So in this segment, um, we're going to be talking about sorting and culling your birds um, for your breeding program. This is a very basic uh, culling and sorting program. I'm not going to go in into real depth as far as you know culling for you know different genetics or multiple genetics. Um, that's a little bit more advanced, but we may do you know something on that in the uh, future. Um, so. I guess, let's see, our audio sounds good. We've got quite a few people already in the house. Uh, we can go ahead and just jump right into it. Like I said, um, we are talking about uh, culling or sorting your birds. Now at this point, um, we have talked about uh, brooding your chicks and getting them into a grow out pen, which is what you hear, see here. And normally what you do is grow your birds up to you know six or eight weeks. Uh, and then you're gonna gonna want to start going through your birds, sorting them, you know, according to sex, sorting them according to color, um, and sorting them, you know, according to weight. If you are looking at a breeding program, or a uh, um, a jumbo breeding program, uh, there is some criteria that uh, I like to uh, have my birds meet in order to be selected for my breeding program. And I do want to say, guys, this is, is basically how I do it. You know, there, there may be, you know, several other ways of, you know, selecting and, and culling your birds. Uh, but this is basically just the way I do it, uh, just to give you an idea. So we've already had um, our birds make weight. And at this time, you know, right around six to eight weeks, your birds are going to start laying or your hens are going to start laying. And that's going to be the time when you're going to want to go through and select um breeders uh to add to your you know your your quail operation um it'll also be the time where some of the culled birds may go into a meat pen um you can see these are basic uh layer cages uh, the only difference between a standard layer cage and a grow cage is it has the egg rollout on it uh, the floor is slanted so the eggs can roll forward and then they've got a, a tray external from the cage which makes it easy to collect the eggs it also makes uh helps with keeping the eggs clean and from getting damaged you know by the birds kicking them around so um this is a basic setup that i use for my uh my breeding uh birds that i'm adding to my uh my breeding operation um it's, it's just your standard uh uh, layer cage. Some of them have dividers down the middle. Some of them are wide open, you know, 36 inches wide uh, by 20 some odd inches deep. And uh, basically what I do is the birds that I select, they go into these cages and are used for production. Now that production uh, could be uh, either meat birds. It could also be, you know, a colored line uh, if that's what you're working with. Uh, but for the most part, uh, birds that are added to your breeding program are used for, you know, usually one of three things. First thing being producing eggs uh, for, you know, personal consumption um, or, you know, selling eating eggs. Uh, also, um, they could be for producing eggs that you are going to uh, select and add to your or put into the incubator and incubate out uh, for your next generation of birds. <clears throat> or they uh, may be eggs that uh, you are collecting to ship out to other people, hatching eggs, uh, you know, for other people to hatch out. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, uh, well, let me go ahead um, and go in. Uh, birds that don't quite make your, your breeding program uh, may go out into a, a meat pen or a pen where you're going to grow them up a little bit larger and uh you know eventually process them um whether it's you know for personal consumption or for you know uh, uh meat for sale or birds for sale that with intent they are going to be butchered um so those are basic the, the basics of what you might be hanging on to your birds for <clears throat> whether it's layers you know meat pen um hatching eggs, eating eggs, and, you know, and so on. Uh, so I want to get into now talking about culling. Um, there are two main reasons that I will cull a bird for right off the top. No questions asked. 
Uh, if they meet either of these requirements, they are out of my breeding program. And the first one is, oh, I forgot to say, I'm sorry about that. I forgot to say aviary. Uh, you may be growing up your birds uh, and uh, sorting them out and selecting birds that you want to keep uh, to put in, you know, a, an aviary type setting, uh, which, you know, may be the only type of cage that you have. Um, I got I got to keep in mind that not everybody has, you know, a setup where they've, they've got a, you know, a room full of cages and several different breeding programs. Some people have, you know, a single aviary or multiple aviaries, um, you know, on their farm and they just raise the birds up because, you know, they're pretty and they look good. Uh, and, you know, it's supply of eggs and whatnot. So back to uh, the two um, requirements that if the birds fall into either of these categories, they are out of my, my breeding program. And the first one is aggression. Uh, any, any bird that I find in my flock that is aggressive, they are automatically out there. There's no second chances. Now, I, I don't want you to confuse aggression with, you know, your standard pecking order. Um, once, you know, a bird could be in a pecking order, but if, he, if he's aggressive uh, and causes damage, like you see to the bird on the left, uh, that bird's eye was plucked out. Um, and for me, there's no sense in keeping that bird. Um, even if it met all the other requirements, I don't want a bird in my, in my flock that has, you know, a bad eye, whatever. Um, you know, some people may, may keep those. I just, I don't. Uh, and the bird on the right, that is the aggressor. You can see his little blood spot on his cheek there. Uh, that bird, uh, just decided he was going to be an idiot and, you know, attack the other birds. I don't know what his issue was, but, uh, he's automatically called. Both these birds were... Uh, put down shortly after uh, after this photo was taken. Uh, the other <laughs> the other uh, reason that I will automatically call a line of birds is if I hatch out mixed birds. Uh, if I order birds from somebody and it's a, a certain color or um, or yeah, basically a certain color that should breed 100% true and I get stuff like this. Now, this image here is an actual picture of um, a hatch that hatched out and it was supposed to be one color and I got four. Uh, I got your standard pharaoh, I got heterozygous fee, and I got uh, homozygous fab fee and plus the whites. Um, if I if I get birds like that and they hatch out like that, when I order something that should hatch out 100% true, first thing I do is contact uh, the breeder, the person that I bought the egg, hatching eggs from and explain to them what happened. And, you know, if they tell me, oh, congratulations, you got multiple colors, I'm done. I don't do business with that person anymore. Uh, if they say, if they apologize and say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I accidentally mixed up some eggs, you know, let me go ahead and reship. Then I'll give them another chance. I'll give them a second chance. If they blow at that time, they're done. I won't even mess with them again. Uh, these birds here, in a normal situation, I would have called them as chicks uh, just because I don't want to have to feed them. Uh, but this uh, was a small enough group to where I like, you know, it's not going to cost me a whole lot in feed to grow these guys up. I have a guy that will buy pretty much everything that I can produce uh, once they're off the heat. He'll take them. So that's where these birds are have already gone actually so um, now i want to start talking about some of the stuff that you want to look for in your birds when you are going to start culling or start sorting your birds and the first one is uh confirmation or conformity of the bird um, tamara roselle of camilla quail has uploaded these pictures here to uh, a couple of the different uh, facebook group pages uh, the one on the left shows the uh, correct confirmation of the birds. This is what you're going to want to look for uh, when uh, selecting your breeders. You know, you want there's uh, different things. You want a bird. First thing I look for is a bird that stands alert. Um, I'll sit back and I'll watch my cages. And it's real easy, especially if you have a lot of birds in the cage. Uh, there's always a few of them in there that are always standing up real tall and proud above the rest of them. Uh, males will usually do it when they crow. You'll see them stand up, you know, big and tall. Um, but, uh, Tamara has, you know, a list of all the different things, you know, like, uh, 
you know, bright eyes, neat beak, um, obviously standing alert. They should be, you know, uh, basically like a peacock, standing proud, um, a nice even slope on their back. And then the other image is the faults that uh, would disqualify a bird from being in your breeding program. And th these, these images here are available on the Facebook group page, Cadernix Corner, uh, in the file section if you want to download them and keep them for your, uh, you know, for your breeding program. Um, but here are a couple, uh, I believe these are five, five and a half or six week old um, hens. Uh, they are jumbo pharaohs. And if you notice, like the one on the left, she, she's already got that correct, you know, standing tall posture. I really like that. Um, her eyes are nice and clear. Uh, the beak, there's no deformities of the beak. The top, the top beak or bill is not um, extended, you know, too far past the lower bill. Um, she's got a nice round curvature of her back. Um, there's no, you know, bumps or, you know, it doesn't look like hunchback bird and she's got a nice full breast. Uh, the image behind me, um, her back looks nice. You know, the, the feathers are all nice and neat. Uh, but the main reason I want to show you this picture is because of the pinning on the back. A lot of people look for uh, straight pinning going down the back of their pharaohs or birds that show pinning. Uh, and this one, for the most part, has, you know, straight pinning. But that, to me, is really not all that important. Um, one reason is because there, there is no real standard of perfection. So there is no... Uh, you know, that there's no guidelines uh, what to go by as far as color. Uh, conformity, now I can see. Even without a standard of perfection, you want the conformity to be nice. But as far as color and that really goes, you know, I don't think uh, that, I think that falls under personal preference. At least for me, it does. Now, this guy here, this is um, a rooster, uh, probably about the same age, maybe, you know, six, seven weeks. Uh, if you look at him, he, he squatted down. We call them potatoes, kind of like a couch potato. But if you see a, a, a rooster or even a hen walking around in the cage and they're squatted down like this, their body's always low to the ground. Even when they're walking, it's almost like they're, uh, you know, crawling, I guess you'd call it. Uh, they don't make it. Those are potatoes. Um, we don't keep them in our breeding program. Uh, this here is just a close-up of... Another bird that I really like, you know, it's got um, nice, clean eyes, no issues around the eyes, you know, as far as, you know, eye boogers, I call them. Um, the beak is nice and neat. Uh, the upper part of the beak it does not extend too far past the, the lower part. The nostrils are all nice and clean. There's no, you know, any kind of secretions or anything from the nostrils. And the feathers are nice and neat. If you look at the feathering on this bird, it, it's kind of uniform all the way. I wish I could point to it and you guys could see it, but um, the, the feathers are nice and uh, neat is the best word I could come up for it. So um, that was definitely a bird that I liked and that I kept. Another thing you want to really look at, uh, especially if you are breeding for jumbo lines, is look at their feet. Um, you want to make sure that the leg is stout enough and, and big enough to support the weight of the bird. You don't want a leg that's, you know, real skinny and bony looking. Um, otherwise, you're going to run into issues, especially once, you know, your jumbo's lines start getting a little bit uh, heavier. Um, that could present a problem. Also, look at the toes. Um, you want that center toe uh, nice and straight. Now, this picture is kind of wonky. It's just the way the bird's standing. Um, normally, they would be basically straight in front of you, but uh, you want both the, the center toes uh, are your longest toes. You want them nice and straight. I also like the the outer toe, a wide spread on them, and to be able to see that there's good webbing in between the toes. That just, you know, helps them with, uh, you know, stability. Uh, you don't end up having, you know, foot problems. I also look at the nails. I want to make sure that all the nails are present. There's no, you know, poop balls built up on their nails. Uh, if there is, that's not necessarily uh, a disqualifier. Uh, because the poop balls can also, you know, always be removed. Um, but for the most part, you know, look at the feet, make sure that they're nice, sturdy, healthy looking feet and, uh, you know, no deformities or issues. Uh, this is a cage of cold chicks. 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many of chicks were in there, but all these birds did not make my breeding program. They were selected for one reason or another to go into a pen, which will be a little bit more feathered out, and then they will be sold to my buddy. But if you look at this little guy right here to my right, uh, his right foot, you see how it's, it's kind of curled under? Um, I don't know if that uh, was from birth and I just didn't notice it, um, or if maybe he got his foot damaged, uh, you know, twisted an ankle, broke an ankle, whatever. Um, but any birds that show any kind of uh, signs like that, like if I have chicks hatch out and they have curled toes, I don't try to do the, um, where you tape like a, a Band-Aid or a piece of cardboard on the bottom of their feet, a sandal, I think they call it. I don't do any of that. I automatically call the bird. But um, all these birds here uh, were called out of my program on our, are going to uh, uh, the guy that buys all my, my extras. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, selecting uh, birds for, um, for size, uh, which will be going into either a, a meat production scenario or into a jumbo uh, breeding program. Um, basically, right between six and eight weeks, uh, some people do it, you know, six, eight, and 10 weeks. They weigh their birds. Uh, but before any of my birds, uh, jumbos that I'm keeping get weighed, they still have to pass the conformity um, and the basic health criteria before they get to this point. Um, it used to be that when weighing birds, uh, the target weight was like 10 ounces at 10 weeks. Um, I think for the most part, a lot of breeders have bumped that target weight up to closer to 12 ounces. Uh, this bird here, I think is eight, right at eight weeks old. And she's already at almost 13 ounces, 12 and a half ounces. So that's not bad uh, for a breeder. She actually did make the, uh, the breeding program. Um, but uh, when you're weighing birds, um, as far as jumbo lines, uh, your roosters, you want right around 250 grams, and your hens around 300 grams at eight weeks. Um, that will Those birds will grow into, you know, a decent-sized jumbo. And the reason you want your roos a little bit smaller than your hens is you don't want to, you know, stress your hens out or tax your hens by having, a, you know, a big, heavy male trying to mount them. They can actually you know, uh, break a leg, not the rooster, but the hen can actually break a leg trying to support that extra weight. So, uh, yeah, try to keep your roos a little bit smaller than your hens. And for the most part, your, your roosters are going to run smaller than the hens. Anyhow, the hens are going to be the, the beefier, bulkier birds. Um, this picture here is, um, a breeding group of jumbos that are my line. I, I think these guys are about eight weeks old. Uh, but you can see the hen on the left got a really nice full breast. Um, that's one of the things I look for. Um, now, when I when I grab my hens, I can pretty much tell when I when I pick them up if I can feel that nice full breast. I don't I'm not feeling a a breast bone protruding. Um, so uh, that's one of the first things I look for. Then I'll weigh them, and as long as they're you know around the 11 and a half to 12 and a half ounce mark. Um, at eight to 10 weeks that they'll make the breeding program. Um, but you can see all these birds are all, they are, they do have the sex link brown gene, unfortunately. I'm still working on cleaning them up, but um, you can see that all the birds are, for the most part, standing tall, um, nice clean eyes, beaks. Um, I, I should have got a shot of, better shot of her feet. You can see that, you know, they've got pretty good stout legs to, uh, help support that weight. So that is what I do for birds that I am breeding for me. Um, you may have a, no, I, I, I want to reword that. I don't, I don't, didn't mean breeds that are, birds that I'm breeding for me, birds that I'm breeding for a jumbo line to produce birds that will be uh, kept for me and also eggs. Um, this is a, a photo of some of the uh, calico fees that I hatched out from Michael Rose over at Southwest Game Birds. Uh, I have never had uh, calicos in my breeding program. Uh, Michael was kind enough to send me some normal calicos and some K2 
calico fee. So the all of these birds that hatched out, I am keeping them. Um, for the, the main reason is one, I want to see how they feather out when they get a little bit older. But two, like I said, I've never had them before. So I really don't know what to look for um, as far as, you know, conformity and health. That's no problem. But as far as looking at, you know, for like pattern and color or not, I, I need to raise them up a little bit longer, you know, so I, I know. Um, you can see the one on the left, uh, his, his facial markings look like they may have some brown in it. So I'm going to have to check with Michael, but I believe that one is going to be heterozygous fee. And the one on the right, which is, uh, you know, more grayscale, there's, there's no brown in them. Um, that's going to be homozygous fee. And I actually have a couple in this group that look like they are carrying the Rue gene. So I, I'm definitely hanging on to them because I want to see, you know, how they're going to turn out. Uh, here are a couple um, of the normal color calicos, uh, the one on the left being standard feral color, and the one on the right you can see uh, is carrying the Rue gene. Uh, it's just a little bit uh, lighter brown. Um, those are also being hung on to. Uh, like I say, I want to get them all feathered out uh, before you know I select uh, my new breeders for the year. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about color. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, pattern modifiers and uh, diluter genes. Uh, this here are pictures of a couple um, sparkly Italians. Uh, the one on the left is a heterozygous sparkly Italian, meaning that it's only carrying one copy of the uh, sparkly gene. And the one behind me is a homozygous uh, sparkly Italian, uh, meaning it's got two copies of the Fee gene. And I, a lot of people like the, the look of the heterozygous more than they do the homozygous, but I like the homozygous, and that would be the bird that I would select to put into my breeding program. One, because he's got two copies of the, the uh, sparkly gene. Uh, so when I go to breed him back to, like, say I want to create a, uh, a sparkly feral line, I can take a, a male uh, homozygous sparkly, breed him to my, my normal hens, and I know that every chick that hatches out will be heterozygous uh, for sparkly. And so I can get right back into, uh, you know, breeding. I can breed those back together and get homozygous skin. So that's just my thinking as far as uh, some of the colors or some of the uh, pattern modifiers. Um, now talking about um, diluter genes, um, I really like them too. Uh, the one on the left is obviously fee, and that's basically uh, the fee gene is just a gene that uh, eliminates all the, the brown coloration in a bird, leaving you with a, a grayscale copy of the bird. Uh, but the one that behind me, that is a project that I am working towards. Uh, I'm going full bore on it this year, uh, and that is the red pansy, uh, which is basically just a, uh, a pansy that is carrying the Rue gene. Um, this is one of the prettiest males uh, that I hatched out from uh, some eggs that William Carl Foster sent me. Unfortunately, I don't have this guy anymore, so I'm, I'm starting from scratch, but I am making a little bit of headway with it. Um, so later on this year, hopefully I will have a, a whole red pansy line available. Uh, this is this is kind of a, a weirdo here. Uh, this is coming out of my, my pansy projects that I'm working on. Uh, what I did was I introduced uh, some Egyptian, an Egyptian male into a small group of pansy females. And this is what hatched out. And it turned out that the Egyptian male uh, was also sparkly. Um, I wish I would have put a picture up there so you could see it. But this is kind of like a pansy sparkly roux. Uh, I showed quite a few people this picture or, or pictures of this bird and they said, yeah, it looks pansy. It looks like it's carrying the sparkly gene. Uh, what I need to do is either breed the hens back to the father or cross siblings. And I should be able to get the, uh, eliminate the sparkly, but pull out the, uh, the Rue gene, giving me the red pansy. So this is, 
I'm hanging on to this because I want to see, you know, what what's going to happen when I breed them back together. Like I said, either with the father or with the uh, their siblings, uh, just because it, it's kind of a strange colored bird. OK, another thing you're going to want to do uh, when you are selecting your birds is to have a way to identify them. Uh, for the most part, most people will tag their their birds using like the the little uh, rings. I didn't bring a picture of that up either. Uh, but what I use, and you can see it on this bird's foot over there, uh, is just colored zip ties. They're little four inch zip ties. Uh, you can pick them up on Amazon really cheap. I think they're like, you know, six or eight dollars for a bag of multiple colored zip ties. And how I use the zip ties is the left leg tells me what um, what breeding cage or what line that that bird came from. Each color represents a different uh, breeding cage or line. Um, the right leg is the leg that I use to tell me what they are carrying as far as modifiers, whether it's you know a certain gene, um, whether it's a pattern modifier or a diluter gene. Um, I can tell, you know, some birds, you don't have to mark them because it's obvious just by looking at the at the plumage, what it's carrying. But a lot of times if you, you know, you've got a a bird that may be heterozygous for something and you're not 100 percent sure that it's in there, uh, you'll go ahead and mark that bird with whatever color you choose. Uh, like if the bird. Uh, well, well, the yellow on this bird um, shows me which line it came from on the other leg, say it had a red band that would be telling me that it has um, the Rue gene in it or a possible carrier of the Rue gene. So uh, those are what I use um, are the zip ties. Like I said, you can get them really cheap. I think Walmart even carries them. Uh, you can get a pack of different colored zip ties and use them for identifying your birds. Uh, you could also just buy the, the little um, leg bands. Uh, I don't know what size millimeter wise that you would have to get. Um, I would, you know, check into some of the... Uh,